Hello and welcome to week 11's lectures. In this session, we'll be looking closely at chapter 5 of Avril Stevenson's The Strange Case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. So, in this chapter, we'll be looking at the uh, presence of an important narrative element, which is a letter. And we know that letters are important documents and they play functional roles in a story world, and we can see that they have disruptive roles to play too. So, let's see what are the consequences of a letter in this particular novella. Chapter 5 is entitled The Incident of the Letter. Now we have Mr. Utterson, the friend of Dr. Jekyll, paying a visit to uh, Dr. Jekyll and um, he is visiting him in his laboratory for the first time and, and that in itself is very strange because uh, these two men have had a very long association with one another and this is the first time that Mr. Utterson is going to enter the uh, scientific premises of this uh, physician and let's see how it looks like and what are its implications for the narrative and the society uh, in which this uh, novel is situated. The building that was indifferently known as the laboratory or the dissecting room. So, it has twin names, it has two names. Again, the idea of a binary is coming up. So, uh, the, the lab is also known as the dissecting rooms, uh, rooms in which experiments were carried out, experiments of a, a scientific nature. And uh, he eyed the dingy, he being uh, Mr. Utterson. The name, by the way, is also very symbolic. Utterson is somebody who utters. So, what is he uttering? And his narrative about uh, this particular story world is also very, very interesting and needs to be unpacked. So, that is an aside. Let us go back to the uh, laboratory. He eyed the dingy windowless structure with curiosity and he gazed round with a distasteful sense of strangeness as he crossed the theatre, once crowded with eager students and now lying gaunt and silent. This description is again very uh, a metaphoric. There is a comparison being drawn between this space and a human being, a particular kind of human being. So, let us uh, take this slowly. So, we have a, a very uh, narrow, uh, closed uh, speciality here. It is dingy, not very convenient, it is it, it's, it, it's kind of a damp place uh, and um, it is also slightly dark and uh, not a comfortable space. That clearly comes through. It is windowless, meaning there is no air coming into this particular uh, structure. Lack of fresh air indicates, um, you know, some kind of decay, a, a, a kind of a decaying atmosphere is present. And um, Mr. Addison is very curious and that curiosity could also be linked to his detective skills too. He is playing an amateur detective here in this particular novella or short novel. And there is a sense of distaste in him. What else brings up his distaste? Uh, can you think back and tell? Um, if you remember the early part of the story, the presence of Mr. Hyde brings a lot of distaste to the um, onlookers. So, uh, like Mr. Hyde, this structure also evokes a sense of distaste uh, in the person who is uh, experiencing this particular uh, space. There is a sense of strangeness too uh, as he crosses this theatre, this um, you know surgical theatre. Um, this space was once owned by a surgeon and now Dr. Jekyll, uh, a physician, uh, a scientific man associated with chemistry owns this space. So, this space was once crowded with eager students. So, there was a big crowd of learners here, but now it is lying gaunt and silent. 
we get a sense that somebody is lying, um, you know, in a, in a uh, sleeping position, and um, that person is um, gaunt looking, uh, tired, haggard, and quiet. Yeah. So that is the sense that we get, and um, we also uh, get the sense that uh, this atmosphere is not very healthy. Gaunt and silence indicates uh, a quite despair too. A sense of despair is quite apparent. The lab is a large room fitted around with glass presses, glass cabinets, cupboards, furnished among other things with a cheval glass and a business table and looking out upon the court by three dusty windows barred with iron. This phrase is very interesting. I'll come to that in a second. Uh, so, as I mentioned, glass presses or cabinets in which all those chemical, um, you know, uh, material are stored uh, in containers, and there's a glass, uh, a big looking glass, and we'll, um, you know, uh, discuss the significance of that uh, in a minute. And uh, it looks upon the courtyard uh, uh, with, uh, and and there are three dusty windows. Um, there's nothing very strange about dusty windows. One, it indicates that it has not been cleaned up on a regular basis which means that nobody is coming into the room so this room is very very private um, so that's one uh, indication that we get it's a private space even though it's associated with something public in the sense that this space is related to scientific knowledge that's the impression we get when we think of uh, labs don't we so um, and the other interesting thing as I pointed out is uh, three windows which are barred with iron so one it is um, a very protective space as well and two it is symbolically a prison space for the doctor who is somehow locked up, bound up by the activity that he is engaged in. So, something is tying him up uh, symbolically and that is structurally manifested by the three barred windows, uh, but not just with any other material, but with iron. So, uh, again, the sense of imprisonment uh, comes up to our mind, um, the idea of incarceration and we think back to the previous novel that we read, A Tale of Two Cities, where the central characters uh, keep uh, getting imprisoned time and again. So, um, people are being bound up either symbolically or literally uh, by the uh, cultural and, um, you know, uh, bureaucratic discourses of the day. I want to show you the picture of a cheval glass before going back to that earlier excerpt. So, this is the cheval glass, the long mirror. Why does Dr. Jekyll need such a big looking glass in his lab? That is an important question to ask. What is the purpose? Is he a Wayne man? Is he Wayne? Is he very proud of his appearance? Is he very anxious about his appearance? And here we are reminded of other uh, looking glasses that we came across uh, in our uh, fiction that we read for this course. And we do come across mirrors in Jane Austen's Persuasion, especially in Kellynch Hall. And um, Admiral Croft makes a mention that there are several looking glasses in the hall, and these looking glasses bother him, and he gets uh, rid of some of the superfluous ones with the help of his wife. So, looking glasses, mirrors indicate vanity and what exactly is um, Dr. Jekyll vain about, proud about? So, that is a mystery that will be unraveled as the novella heads to a, a kind of a, a blazing conclusion. So, let us go back, let us get back to that earlier uh, slide. A fire burnt in the grate. Grate is that fireplace. A fire burnt in the grate. Uh, a lamp was set lighted on the chimney shelf, for even in the houses the fog began to lie thickly. And there, close up to the warmth, sat Dr. Jekyll looking deadly sick. 
So, the uh, most obvious thing first, Dr. Jekyll is very ill. Now, I want you to think back to the uh, metaphoric figure which is lying gaunt and uh, sick um, that was uh, used in the context of that space. The entire uh, you know theater room, the surgical room uh, looks like as if it is a person lying down um, you know uh, uh, prostrate with illness. So, we have a literal manifestation of sickness in the figure of Dr. Jekyll here. So, how uh, interesting um, the, uh, you know uh, there is a coincidence. So, uh, the metaphorical illness is kind of uh, literally embodied in the figure of Dr. Jekyll and so that is one um, you know interpretation that we can uh, easily make of this passage. There are others. A fire burns, it is a really warm place. The place is warm, it is very comfortable. We get that sense when we read that uh, in this passage, you know, a fire burns here, there is a lamp uh, on the chimney uh, shelf, and Dr. Jekyll sits close up to the uh, fireplace to get a lot of warmth. So, this passage gives us an indication that there is a comfort, there is a lot of comfort and coziness to this uh, place, but there is one disturbing element. What is that disturbing element? That is the reference to the fog. Fog, it is mists, it, it kind of blocks one's um, vision, it kind of muddies the atmosphere, it is very unhealthy it is very unhealthy. Inhaling fog is not very good for one's health. If you feel that there is fog in the room, then there is something wrong in this place too. So, uh, let us see what the narrator says again. Even in the houses, the fog began to lie thickly. So, even inside the house, there is a kind of a thick smoke like air. So, if you have smoke like air in your room, what does that indicate? Uh, that indicates as I said an unhealthy uh, you know air in the room, that is the literal uh, interpretation. The metaphoric interpretation is that something is really wrong in terms of the moral order, in terms of the moral universe of this uh, particular domesticity, this particular house and therefore the entire society of London itself. So, fog is usually known to kind of spread over the urban space because the urban space houses all the factories, the industrial structures. So, there is a lot of industrial activity which is coughing up a lot of smoke into the atmosphere. So, the urban space is usually what is associated with smoke and smog. And now, that smoke and smog is kind of entering the household spaces. If you think about Dickens's fiction, there is quite a lot of fog in his uh, universes. For example, Bleak House opens with a, a description of the fog that is kind of smothering, um, you know, suffocating the uh, life of the people uh, of London. And um, even in uh, A Tale of Two Cities, if you look at the opening scene when the Dover coach is, um, you know, uh, moving on the landscape of Bridgen, there is a lot of uh, fog and smoke. And, and uh, the wintry air is mixed up with all these bad vapors. So, um, you know, fog is something that indicates the, the uh, skewed nature, uh, the moral turpitude of society. And we get the same, uh, you know, motif here. We call this the motif in uh, literature. Same motif is drawn in this particular narrative, too. So, we saw this. Now, if we want to know about the context of this particular excerpt, we need to go back to uh, chapter 4, where we saw that a Sir Danvers Carew was murdered brutally by uh, Mr. 
Edward Hyde and uh, Ed Edward Hyde becomes notorious across uh, London and uh, quite naturally Dr. Jekyll is affected by the news that his close aide, the man, the young man he, whom he has taken under his wing is the uh, culprit, the criminal who could um, you know, enact such cruelty over a vulnerable, aged, respectable uh, you know, MP. So uh, once he comes to know about this, he falls sick. So that's the assumption we can make. Uh, he's, uh, he falls sick and this is Mr. Utterson coming to visit his friend. And this is Dr. Jekyll's promise to his friend. He says that I bind my honor to you that I'm done with him in this world. It's all at an end. And indeed, he does not want my help. You do not know him as I do. He is safe. He is quite safe. Mark my words, he will never more be heard of. So we know that everybody is hunting, um, you know, uh, hunting. Everybody is trying to hunt down Mr. Edward Hyde. He has disappeared. Nobody can track him down. Nobody can, um, you know, uh, give out a, a, a portrait um, that would uh, help people, uh, you know, trace him because nobody can describe him adequately. So he seems to have uh, kind of disappeared into the smog of London. And um, this is Dr. Jekyll who says that he is safe. He's quite safe, and he's not going to be heard of you won't even he hear about him and he, um, he further says that I am done with him in this world I'm no longer going to be associated with uh, Edward Hyde uh, our association our friendship is at an end and this is very interesting in this entire uh, quotation he says that he does not want my help he does not want my help anymore. Uh, I don't uh, need to be his guide. He can act on his own. And um, further, this is another interesting uh, statement. You don't know him as I do. I am quite well versed with the um, dynamics of his personality. And that's why I tell you that uh, he does not want my help. Uh, so this is a mysterious um, you know, uh, narrative about Hyde. And then there's further promise that Dr. Jekyll offers about not, uh, not going to be associated with him anymore. When he says uh, he's quite safe, he's also hinting that society is also safe from him. In other words, there will be no more criminal activities uh, that will be committed by him. Therefore, uh, he is indirectly hinting that please let him lie low and leave him to himself. He will not come back into respectable society. Dr. Jekyll also uh, offers Mr. Uh, Utterson and another uh, interesting object um, here. And he says that uh, I have received a letter and I'm at a loss whether I should show it to the police. I should like to leave it in your hands, Utterson, you would judge wisely. I'm sure I have so great a trust in you. Um, so uh, this is another document that's coming up in this narrative. The first document that is much discussed is the will, the will of Dr. Jekyll, which he keeps amending, right? He first says that on his death, the property would uh, go to Mr. Edward Hyde and then he says that it would go to Mr. Hyde even if he disappears, even if Dr. Jekyll disappears for um, more than three months, the property has to automatically go to Edward Hyde. So that is one interesting document that uh, uh, we have seen uh, in this narrative early on. and. Um, Victorian fiction in general is associated with, uh, you know, who's going to uh, get the money. Uh, you know, the novels are obsessed with this, uh, um, you know, uh, topic. Who is going to get the property at the end of the novel? Is it um, the central hero? Is it somebody else? What are the implications of getting the property? So these are some of the questions that, uh, you know, fascinates Victorian uh, fiction, 19th century fiction. And if you go back to um, uh, Austen's Persuasion, we know that Anne Elliot is not going to get Kellynch Hall, right? And Ellie doesn't want the property, and that's very interesting. And um, she refuses to marry a man who will get the property for her, and she instead chooses a, a kind of an adventurer. 
Captain Wentworth, who makes money on his own merit. So, um, so that's a different kind of dynamic that we have. But on the whole, uh, Victorian fiction, 19th century fiction is geared towards answering this question of uh, who is going to be the inheritor of the biggest property in, in that um, you know, uh, novel universe. So here, who is going to get the property of Dr. Jekyll is one of the questions that is fascinating to answer and that question will be answered quite uh, you know um, unexpectedly quite curiously uh, um, at the end of the novel because the, um, you know we will um, come to know of a person who is quite different whom we don't expect to inherit the money uh, get it at the end of the day. So we have talked about the document of the will now, I would like to talk about the letter and uh, Dr. Jekyll offers this object to Mr. Utterson. He says that I don't know what to do about it, I am at a loss. He, he kind of uh, represents himself as a helpless person here and he uh, seeks the help of the lawyer, Mr. Utterson. And he says that uh, I don't know whether I should hand it to the police, uh, but then I should like to leave it in your hands. Look at the way the uh, you know uh, idea shifts. The idea of Mr. Jekyll shifts, and he says that I should like to leave it in your hands because you are um, such a capable, wise person, and I trust you quite a lot. There's a there's a very interesting uh, play of ideas in this word trust. Uh, you know, he's indicating something here. And I want you to go back to the first uh, chapter of this novella and there we see a crowd scene, a scene in which Mr. Hyde cruelly tramples down a little girl and the crowd is furious. They want to get this man, um, you know, uh, to the police, but then they, they don't. They don't get him to the police. What they do instead is they blackmail him into giving the girl's family hundred pounds. So instead of going to the legal system, the judicial system, uh, the police system, they uh, kind of solve the matter privately. The same formula is kind of utilized here. Um, look at the way Dr. Jekyll, you know, uh, throws out that question. I don't know whether I should um, go to the police, uh, but I'll give it to you. So he is just solving the matter privately uh, in some ways, or he is strategically doing it for reasons of his own. So this is an interesting, uh, you know, thing that we can think about the attitude of the Jekyll, uh, and I would use the word manipulative here. Since I've read the novel and I know what the outcome is, I, in retrospect, I would call this as extremely manipulative behavior in which uh, Dr. Jekyll is trying to play on the values of honor and integrity and loyalty that Mr. Utterson holds dear. And he knows that he can trust in Mr. Utterson who will not do anything that will bring scandal to Dr. Jekyll's reputation. And an interesting qu a question follows uh, from Mr. Utterson. He asks his friend, have you the envelope? I burned it, replied Jekyll. Before I thought what I was about, it bore no postmark. The note was handed in. So uh, Mr. Utterson asks a very interesting question, a pointed question. And he's once again playing the detective here. He's hoping to trace the origin, the place of origin of the letter because that would give some indication as to the place in which it was posted and that would get the police uh, on the track to, um, you know, hunting this criminal down and the, quest, uh, and the question is immediately answered by Jekyll who says, I burnt it and um, he, he kind of uh, expresses it very innocently before I knew what I was about before I thought what I was about why was this hurry why was he in a hurry to burn it 
But then he, uh, you know, uh, covers up his mistake of the uh, supposed mistake by saying that there was no postmark, there was no stamp on the envelope. It was handed in at the house, um, and that's why it doesn't matter, uh, you know, uh, whether I bought the envelope or not. So there is a lot of, you know. Um, uh, uh, hodgy podgy about uh, the way in which Dr. Jekyll, uh, you know, uh, treats the letter, and he adds to the mystery that is enveloping the origins and the current place of uh, Mr. Hyde. This is the response of Mr. Utterson, who says, "Well, I shall consider." Return the lawyer, and now. One word more, it was Hyde who dictated the terms in your will about that disappearance. The doctor seemed seized with a qualm of faintness. He shut his mouth tight and nodded. I knew it, said Utterson. He meant to murder you. You had a fine escape. So while there is this uh, discourse about the letter and its uh, implications, such as where did it come from, why is it addressed to Hyde and, and what was in the letter, um, you know, we, we never know what was in the letter. Uh, interestingly enough, this chapter does not tell us, Mr. Utterson does not tell us, we do not know exactly what uh, Mr. Hyde apparently wrote to Dr. Jekyll. That is immaterial, the content is immaterial, what is um, important, significant for narrative purposes is uh, its form, the, the you know, the uh, physical uh, element, the object that it becomes and which is transferred to uh, Mr. Utterson. Anyway, the lawyer who uh, has received the letter jumps to the previous uh, document and he is worried about that. He asks this important question to which he wants to know the answer and he asks, was it Hyde who dictated the terms? Did he ask you to write that will? Did he ask you to make that amendment about your disappearance? So um, in that will, if you remember, uh, Jekyll wrote that if I disappear, Mr. Hyde is going to get the money and the house and everything. So uh, Mr. Addison wants to know if it was dictated, um, if he was forced to do uh, such a, uh, you know, Will and the answer is yes. The doctor uh, nods. Um, uh, the doctor nods, agrees with his mouth uh, t uh, shut tight. He just nods, and um, Mr. Utterson is uh, justified. He's quite ecstatic to know that yes, his assumptions have been quite right. Uh, and uh, what that assumption is that he forced him to write uh, amend the will in such a way so that he can immediately get the property if he's able to murder Dr. Jekyll. So he says he meant to murder you. He was going to get rid of you, and now you have escaped his clutches. So. Um, Mr. Utterson is relieved uh, about the disappearance of Mr. Hyde because, uh, you know, uh, that would mean uh, Dr. Jekyll is free of him. Thank you for watching. I will continue in the next session.